Good afternoon, distinguished guests, scholars, professors, and students. Um, let me first introduce myself. My, my name is Zhang Xing. I'm a lecturer of South Asian Studies at Peking University. It is really my honor to have invited Professor Victor Mayer to give the lecture today on Sinology. Um, I have been knowing about Professor Mayer's work for a long time, and also during the past few years, I got a chance to meet him in person on various occasions in different parts of the world. And he was also very helpful um, and also gave me lots of insightful suggestions in the comments when I was writing my dissertation in Germany. So um, this time when we were planning out this lecture on Sinology, I immediately thought about him, and I really appreciate that he agreed to do so given his very busy schedule here in China. Um, as some of you perhaps already noticed, this lecture belongs to the lecture series of our research project called Research Methodologies on Eastern Studies um, that we currently started. So before we formally start the lecture today, I would like to invite Professor Liu Shuxiong, the advising professor of this research project, as well as the professor of South Asian Studies here in Peking University, and also my advisor when I was, um, when I was doing my PhD here, to say a few words about this research project and also how today's lecture um, is going to contribute to it. So let's welcome Professor Liu. Thank you. Respected Professor Dr. Victor Mayer, respected guests and the colleagues, dear students, today it is a great pleasure and honor for us to invite Dr. Victor Mayer to our workshop, Eastern Studies Workshop, School of Foreign Languages at Peking University. Dr. Victor Mayer is a professor from the University of Pennsylvania, the United States. He is a famous sinologist and a Western scholar of Eastern studies. His talk of this afternoon, Methods and Aims on Sinology Then and Now, is 100% coherence with our project 
research methodologies in Eastern studies. I believe that it will surely benefit and inspire us a great deal with our studies. The project of ours is supported by Give to Asia, the United States, and donated by Dr. Zheng Xianzhang's family. This project pays close attention to the accomplishments of Chinese scholars in the studies of Chinese, Japanese, Indian, Arab Islamic, and the ancient Near Eastern cultures, analyzing and highlighting the methodological frameworks that the Chinese scholars relied on and created in the research of the above mentioned fields. It aims at exploring the methodological characteristics in the research of Eastern studies by both the Eastern and the Western scholars, thus strengthening the international academic exchanges in the relevant field. We are very grateful to Dr. Victor Mayer for his coming to our school, and we are now earnestly looking forward to his lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Liu. I'm, I'm sure that all of you are waiting for Professor Mayer to give the lecture, but before that, let me say a few words about you. <laughs> So, I, 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 anyway, I have to do the introduction. So, um, I think as most of you already got to know, Professor Mayer is a professor of Chinese language and literature at the University of Pennsylvania, just as Professor Liu also mentioned, where he has been teaching since 1979. And he holds degrees from Dartmouth College, the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, and Harvard University. So um, chant in, in Indo-European languages such as Sanskrit and Hindi and other Eastern Asian languages, and also, of course, also Chinese. He first focused on Chinese classical literature, including philosophy and, and religion. And turning his attention to Chinese popular liter literature, which had been altogether shunned by both Chinese and Western scholars, he opened an entirely new vista on neglected mainstreams of non-standard writings and their contingency with um, artistic productions. Um, Professor Mary is the, also an editor of more than two dozen books, and also um, he's the editor of Sino um, Platonic Papers, and is and, and it's on the editorial boards of several other Sinological journals. So now let's welcome Professor Mary to give that lecture. <laughs> I think I'll stand up because I like to move around. <laughs> well, uh, do I need uh, uh, amplification? Can, can everybody see me? Okay, can you all hear me? Do you have to stand at the podium? Can you stand at this table here? Yes. <laughs> Well, I could sit down, but I, I like to move around. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're all ready to go. First of all, thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's an honor to have so many people come to hear me talk about uh, Sinology, especially a lot of old friends from far places and new friends from near places. Um, my host uh, requests that I speak in both Chinese and English. Now, I'm not going to do simultaneous translation for myself, uh, but I will use Chinese when it's appropriate and English when it's appropriate. 有的是差一点中文,有的是用英文,要看什么时候去合适。随便, I don't know what I'll, how I'll do it, but I'll do it. You'll hear some English and you'll hear some Chinese, and I hope it all makes sense. Um, and thanks, uh, thanks also to uh, the, this workshop for inviting me to come and give this talk. 
Now, when I was, when I wrote my first book for a commercial press, that was the Tao Te Ching uh, for Bantam, which is a very different thing from writing for a, an academic press. Because when you write for an academic press, you're writing for scholars. And when you write for a commercial press, you're writing for a very large audience. Uh, and you're supposed to sell books. So they asked me, after I finished the book, they said, tell us who you are, give us a little self-introduction. I said, I'm Victor H. Mayer, I'm a sinologist. And they said, stop. You can't be a sinologist. Nobody will know what that means. Say don't come with Ting Budong, so much a sinologist. Um, so I said, okay, I'm a philologist who emphasizes Chinese, China. So that's what my definition of a sinologist is, a philologist who focuses on China. And they said, stop right there. Nobody will know what a philologist is. So then I said, well, I said, well, that's what I am. I'm a philologist who focuses on China. I'm a sinologist. That's my career. That's my profession. And I'm very proud of it. Sorry, they said, you have to be, well, why don't you call yourself a linguist? And I said, well, I'm not a linguist. Even if you think so, there's a big difference between a linguist and a philologist and a sinologist. So I've been struggling with this, uh, trying to educate people about what sinology is and what a sinologist is, you know, ever since the beginning of when I became one. And I still am happy to be a sinologist, and I want to be one until the day I die and become a mummy in Central Asia. I'm, I've decided I'm going to die in Central Asia and become a mummy. Uh, so I shall, be a, uh, I shall be a sinologist until the very last minute of my existence on this earth. Um, so this year, this whole year, I've been on sabbatical from Pren, well, Zheng Nian Xiu Jia. Uh, the first one is uh, That's quite a mouthful. And it's also very I'm sure whoever chose it, chose it very, very carefully. And I'm told that it was Zhao Yubu who chose it, not Bei Da de Zhao Shoman. Because it's a very interesting name. And I will talk about it in a little bit. Uh, and then the first semester when I was at Tsinghua, it was Tsinghua Dashi Guo Shui Yan Zhou Yuan, who invited me to come and talk. And I will discuss both the Chinese names and the English names of these places. And then uh, we have Fudan Dashi Wen Shi Yan Zhou Yuan, National Institute for Advanced Humanistic Studies. And there's also Zuo Tian Wo Zai Zhongguo Ren Min Dashi Jiang, Ye Shi Zai Tam De Ren Min Dashi De Guo Xue Yan. So all these premier uh, universities in China are setting up these institutes for sinological studies and um, an institute for advanced studies. And they're all choosing slightly different names, but they're all hovering around uh, sinology. And some of them say sinology directly, and some of them avoid, avoid the word sinology. Some of them use the uh, expression guo xue, and some use the expression han xue, uh, so we have Guo Xue and Han Xue, and I'm going to talk a lot about the difference between Guo Xue and Han Xue. Um, and then, let's, before I start to talk in detail about these different names uh, in Chinese, I want to talk about the different English names. So we have, uh, because you, please pay attention, I think everybody in the room knows both Chinese and English, in that your degree, of your uh, level in both of these languages is very advanced. So you should be able to tell very easily that the English and the Chinese do not match. They, it's very clear that the 
the English has chosen to speak to foreigners, uh, trying to say, like, what are we in English? Whereas the Chinese name is for the consumption of Chinese. So they're, they're not always saying the same thing. So we have uh, for Beijing, See, that, like, Han Xue Jia, I am a Han Xue Jia. Thank you. I'm a sinologist. And that's the best way to say it in Chinese. Um, but, okay, so it's a GD, which is a base. Al Qaeda. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, a very, very unusual name. And not only is it uh, Al Qaeda, it is also Yan Xiu GD. I am here to Yan Xiu. Yan Xiu. I don't know exactly what that means, but I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm doing my best to Yan Xiu. And what is Yan Xiu? Well, it's probably a shortened form of Yan Zhou Jin Xiu Ba. Probably, which means uh, training, research and training. But am I being trained or am I training someone? I'm not sure. I don't know. And I've been here for a long time, but I'm still wondering what this word Yan Xiu means in reference to Victor Mayer. Uh, maybe somebody, maybe during the question and answer period, we can get some enlightenment on that. Uh, I will speak for about uh, an hour and a half, or an hour and 20 minutes, and then I'll open the floor to questions, because it may be half an hour, 20 minutes, because I want to have some dialogue with you. Okay, so that's uh, GD. And then Tsinghua is the Tsinghua, and you notice it's Tsinghua, it's not Tsinghua, it is Tsinghua. <laughs> and there is a historical reason for that, of course. Uh, and, and also, it's, be, it's, not Peking, it's not Beijing University, it is Peking University. And both Beida and Tsinghua are very adamant and proud of the fact that they are Peking University and Tsinghua <laughs> and not Beijing University and Tsinghua. There's there tradition there, and the tradition is both Western and Eastern. It's all wrapped up together. So it's the Tsinghua Academy of Chinese Learning. Okay, now we get into some real meaty stuff. It's an academy. Uh, and actually, the GD is also an academy. It's not a base. In English, it's an academy. And Guoshui, uh, the Guoshui Yanzhou Yuan at Tsinghua is also an academy. Why is it an academy? Uh, it's, you know, you could say Yanzhou, Yanzhou Yuan should be something like college, right? Or school in current parlance. But the people who translated these, ter these names into English have chosen the word academy, and I'm sure they chose it very, very carefully. And why did they choose the word academy? Because they want to evoke Shu Yuan. You know, they want to evoke this old Chinese, like Neo Confucian Academy of the Song. Uh, and Song through uh, Qing, we had all these uh, academies, Confucian academies. So the, the, actually, the English is more traditional than the Chinese. It, it, it's saying academy and saying Tsinghua and saying Peking University. So the, the English is more, what can I say, Orientalist? Or it's a little bit more old-fashioned than the Chinese. Uh, not a little bit, a lot of it, <laughs> quite a lot. So now we move on to Fudan Dasha Wen Shi Yan Zhou Yuan. And here we have, uh, for, for one thing, they don't say Fudan, they say national. I don't know if everybody else is so happy about that. I mean, like, why is Fudan national and... Beida isn't national. <laughs> huh? I don't know. So this is something that you have to think about. Why don't they say Fudan University? And, and they don't even say Guoxue or Hanxue because, as you will see in a moment, both Guoxue and Hanxue are problematic. They're not simple terms uh, that you can just plug in to Putonghua. 
uh, they have some kind of um, very convoluted historical background, which I will get into. So they, and all, so they avoid Guo Xue and Han Xue by saying Wen Shi, which is really uh, humanistic in purely Chinese terms, uh, literature and history. So it's like humanistic. And um, then we have Zhongguo Renmin Da Xue Guo Xue Yuan, which is like uh, Qinghua, which is a Guo Xue, but they're Guo Xue Yan Zhou Yuan. So, um, now what I, I need to talk a lot about uh, Han Xue and Guo Xue and exactly what kind of words they are and how they came into Chinese and when they came into Chinese and what they mean in Chinese. Because, let's face it, I, I present myself to you as a Han Xue Jia and I am, that's the best way to refer to me <clears throat> in uh, Chinese, Han Xue Jia, if I merit that. Uh, because I say that I, in English I'm a sinologist and what I do is sinology. So, um, it just so happens that both Han Xue, Jia, Han Xue and Guo Xue are what I call Lai Hui Ci, round trip words. They both started out in Old Chinese, in the Han Dynasty, or in even maybe a little bit earlier, but the Han Dynasty, uh, referring to something other than Sinology for sure. Now, we will have to go into the history of the words Han Xue and Guo Xue. It's very interesting that the word Sinology in English is actually much later than I thought it was. It's not, it's not until about 1882 that we have the word Sinology in English. And I think uh, around the same time we get Indology, the 1888. So these are much later than I thought. Uh, I thought that Sinology would go way back into the time of Matteo Ricci, Limado. But actually you can say the roots of Sinology go back to Matteo Ricci and Nicolas Strigot, Giniga, Limado, uh, and the Jesuits who came and brought Western learning to China. And then the, the Western learning took root, you know, like physics, cartography, geometry, so many different areas. Western learning took root in China and it, be, it, it helped to develop Xue, uh, empirical, evidential, learning in the Qing dynasty. Uh, but uh, you see, Kao Zhongxue is not the same as Han Xue. Um, so it took a while for um, this idea of Sinology to come into existence, even uh, the term Sinology to come ex into existence. We have it in German, we have it in French, uh, and we have it in English. Uh, but as a kind of profession, or a discipline, it's not until the late 19th century that it arises. Um, now, in old Chinese texts, what does Han Xue mean? We, we have, it, it means something very different in old Chinese texts and in modern Chinese texts. So in old, old Chinese texts, uh, Han Xue was basically like Xun Gu Xue, applied to the classics, uh, the Confucian classics. It was very specific kind of learning. You could say Han learning, but that's very different from Sinology. And then um, Guo Xue, which is the other term that's often evoked in these institutes, it originally meant a school. It meant a Xue uh, Xiao. Guo Xue was a school. It wasn't a learn kind of learning. So you would enter a Guo Xue, or you would study in a Guo Xue in the Han, Han period. Um, and then it wasn't until um, it wasn't until the 20th century that Guo Xue started to mean uh, like national learning or national studies. 
And how it got to mean that is, involves a trip to Japan, which I'll tell you about a little bit more. And how Hanshe got to mean Sinology also involved a trip to Japan and then getting sent back. So um, both Guoxie and Hanshe in the 20th century started to mean this kind of national learning or Sinology. And uh, the people who sort of introduced it into Chinese parlance, modern Mandarin, uh, are uh, people like Lu Xun who went to Japan. So they were the ones who, who started to talk about uh, Guoxie and Hanshe, referring to uh, comprehensive, broad studies of uh, traditional China. Which it's very different from the old idea of Guoxie and Hanshe. And the, the, in these names of these institutes, it's the modern meaning we're talking about. So then, um, Hanshe, I also want to say that it, it is specifically refers to foreigners who study traditional China. In the Hanyu Dan, it says, uh, so it says foreigners who study traditional Chinese learning, that's Hanshe. It doesn't say Chinese do it, it's what the foreigners do. So it's very clear that uh, Hanshe is intended or was intended when it was first coined to refer to this xenology or sinology or Sinology, what the foreigners do to study old China. And then uh, for Mao Zedong, Mao Zedong also had a, a way to re uh, thinking about uh, Han Xue, and he, for him, it was like a modern academy. Uh, he called it a si, uh, si, uh, si shu. So uh, in his report on Hunan, People's Movement, he says uh, that the people studying in Hanshe, so Hanshe in, in, for Mao Zedong became something like Guoxue in the old times, a place to go study. It was the, uh, like a, a school. Okay, uh, so we know pretty much where and when Hanshe what it meant originally and when it started to mean comprehensive studies of traditional China. Uh, but Guoxia is a little more complicated because uh, it gets involved with the Japanese notion of kokugaku. And kokugaku goes back to the late 17th century and the early 18th century. And it's, in English it's sometimes referred to as nativist or native studies, nativist studies or native and it was sort of like, okay, the Japanese also had kangaku. And they, when they did kangaku, uh, traditionally, they were referring to old chingu type shue in old China. They were trying to be really good Confucian scholars when they did kangaku, han, han shue. But then a new generation of scholars in uh, Japan, so like in opposition to ha kangaku, they came up with the idea of kokugaku. And they emphasize like wagaku, you know, wagakuni, my country, which is Japan. It's not China. Wogo, but in Wogo in China and Japan means Japan. So they have this idea that kokugaku meant uh, nativist Japanese studies that try to avoid Confucian implications and complications. So they they try to go to texts like the Kojiki which is the record of ancestral ancient matters, uh, very old Japanese text, 712 for that one, and the Nihon Shoki, which is uh, the Chronicles of Japan, 720, and the Manyoshu, everybody knows the Manyoshu, the 10,000 leaves, a collection of very old Japanese poetry, that's from the 8th century, late 8th century. So uh, this was Kokugaku, for the Japanese, and the Chinese weren't really talking about kokugaku much, uh, certainly not in that sense, because it would only make sense in the Japanese context. Okay, so then along comes this Western learning, 
this new approach to the study of traditional China, uh, which is very different from the Chinese traditional approach to old China. So here comes Xenology, Sinology, and uh, the Japanese, as with so many other ideas and notions from the West, they said, well, we have to come up with a, a legitimate term for East Asians. And so it was the Japanese who wedded Guo uh, and especially Han Xue to the Western word Sinology. And Guo uh, in the 20th century Japanese, early 20th century Japanese, it referred to the same kind of idea of uh, traditional Chinese learning. So it, it wasn't the old kokugaku from the 17th and 18th centuries. It now was this Western European learning, kokugaku. Uh, so, the, um, so the Chinese uh, overseas students, liu xuesheng in Japan, they get this word hanshe and they take it back to China with this new meaning of what it means in, as Sinology. And I think that's certainly the kind of meaning in, these, in terms of these institutes. It's not the old, old, old meaning. It's, it's this new Europeanized meaning. And if you don't believe me, if you think I'm pushing too hard on the idea of round trip words, I'm gonna rattle off a few now. Uh, they can all be documented very clearly and it'll blow your mind, I think, when you realize that the modern intellectual history of China is very much uh, dependent upon uh, Japanese as a bridge to what, uh, Europe. So, philosophy, Joshua, Tetsugaku. Philosophy in old China did not mean, I mean, Joshua in old China did not mean philosophy but it does in modern Chinese. Okay, Zhongjiao. It means religion now in modern Chinese. But it certainly didn't mean religion in the Song Dynasty. And it comes from Japanese Shukyo. The same two characters. Um, so how about Wenxue? Literature, Bungaku. Jingji, economics. Jingji did not mean economics in the Song Dynasty. It meant administration in some like uh, Sakura or something like that, household administration. It didn't mean economy. So the, these words, there are hundreds and hundreds of these words in modern intellectual discourse that uh, are what I call round trip words. They start in China, they go to Japan, and then they get a new meaning attached to it, and they go back to China. And that's Han Xue and Guo Xue are this kind of word. Um, and I want to say one other, because many of the people in this room are Bo Shi, Bo Shi Xue Wei, or you are aspiring to be Bo Shi. Bo Shi is one of these um, round trip words. And it is very interesting. I wrote a whole long article about the evolution of the term Bo Shi from uh, Han and even a little bit earlier than Han. And we know that it meant erudite, right? It meant, it meant a, um, a scholar who focused on the classics and was very learned uh, in the um, Bo Shi Yan, in the academy. We call them erudites in English, Bo Shi. But then, it's, it's very, very interesting that Bo Shi, by the Tang Dynasty, uh, becomes uh, like, a, like a, a master of some trade. You can say Cha Bo Shi, a tea waiter, which is very different from a Han Dai de Bo Shi. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, William, I'm going to talk about William Hong later in this uh, lecture. Hong Ye, I will have a lot to say about him. And I took classes with him at Harvard. And one time, uh, a, a Chinese lady who was sitting in on his class, she was a very polite lady, and she wanted to address him um, 
in a very respectful way. So she, he came in the room and she said, Hong Bo Shi, What? I'm not a Bo Shi, Cha Bo Shi. I'm not. Bo Shi Hong Jiao Shou. He didn't like to be called a Bo Shi. So there, because of this tradition, this old tradition of Bo Shi, it could even be like a, a cart driver, Gan Che De, in the Yuan Dynasty. And then it could even be a, a musician. It's sort of like we now say Lao Shi, Shi Fu, can be anything, right? These words are very transformational, uh, especially when they have to do with the master. Uh, and we all know how Tong Zhi has gotten changed around. These are very flexible terms. And they usually go down the scale to lower and low, lower levels. And so that's what happened to Bo Shi. But then Bo Shi got elevated in the 20th century because the Japanese said, we need a word for PhD. And we have this Hakase or Hakushi. Hakushi. So Bo Shi got rescued and refurbished. And so now it's very honorable to be called a Bo Shi, but uh, it still has that heritage of the medieval period when it meant something low, you know, from Tang through Yuan, and even on beyond the Yuan. Uh, and and it, it, beyond that, Bo Shi was taken up by Turks and Persians, and it went all over Eurasia. It got into Hindi, Urdu, Bakshi, they call it Bakshi because of the, that you see in Japanese is Hakushi, you get the Ru Sheng Zi. So, it, it was in Persian, it was in uh, all the way to Ottoman Turkish. It was very, uh, very common in Ottoman Turkish to refer to someone as uh, Bakshi. And, and in the Indian army, because it was the Persians who were, ta I, I often talk about the Persians taking around cultural uh, artifacts, cultural ideas. Uh, they're the, what I call the Kultur for Mittler, you know, the cultural brokers the Persians, the Iranian peoples, the Sogdians, the Sasanians, they're the ones who run back and forth around uh, the Silk Road. And they, in the Yuan, Yuan Dynasty, it was the per Persian was like a lingua franca. So that's how Bo Shi got spread all over Eurasia. It started in the Han, and now there it is. So there's, there are these li li si, these um, round trip words. And Bo Xie and Han Xie and Bo Shi. These are example, good examples of uh, words that got new meanings, very radically new meanings in Japan. Okay, so I'm going to start um, discussing Sinology more directly, what it is in, in the West. Um, my, another old teacher of mine at Harvard, Achilles Fang, used to read, or Fang, Fang Jatung, he used to say, he used to call it, uh, and it'll be okay if I hide this as well. He called it acidology. And he says, when we were taking his classes, he would always say, You don't want to become an astronologist. Don't do it. Why do you want to read all those dirty books? He was always trying to discourage people from becoming Han Xue Jia. This is the guy who knew Ezra Pound so well and taught Ezra Pound much of what he knows about Chinese poetry. And he also is the man who uh, knew Marianne Moore. And Marianne Moore called him a wizard with words. And his bathtub was full of books. And he had earlobes like the Buddha, <laughs> Achilles Fang. Uh, so he, he was my teacher, but he always tried his best to prevent people from becoming an astronologist. Uh, because he was actually trying to be kind to you, because to be a real sinologist, uh, it is hard as hell. It's no simple thing. I mean, you have to be very, uh, almost like, uh, masochistic to want to become Han Xue Jia. Uh, by the end of this talk, I hope you will agree with me. It's not for the feeble-minded or the weak of heart. It's for people who have a lot of uh, 
strength, and endurance. Well, I, I, one of my students, my, one of my favorite PhD students, refers to my profession as synology. And I don't like the sound of that. But it's actually a legitimate alternative pronunciation. Synology, synology. It is a kind of sin to do it. Um, now, if you talk about who were sinologists, I mean, if you want some representative sinologists, then you, I, I would think, like, think of the winners of the Stanislas Julien Prize. Stanislas Julien was a great French sinologist. And it's, it's, it's uh, awarded to, uh, like, the very best book, for the very best book it is published in a year, or group of books by a an individual scholar. So the very first Stanislas Julian Prize was given to, not, it's not a surprise that he got it in 1875, James Legg. Yay! James Legg deserved it. I mean, he, he translated all of the Chinese classics, the Confucian classics, and some other things as well. And his translations still stand up, even though they're Victorian. Uh, really reliable. I mean, they're not in the lang they're, they're not in the English language of today, but people they're still getting reprinted and people still refer to him. So he's he's like a, an example of a sinologist uh, and the first winner of the Stanislas Julian Prize. Uh, but then you see the Stanislas Julian Prize. If you look. Uh, look it up on the web and you'll see like the recent winners for the last 20 years or so. They're not in the mold of James Legg at all. So the, 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 if that's the prize for sinology, like the plum prize for sinology, then a sinology has changed radically. Because I know a very close friend of mine won the Stanislas Julian Prize. Her name is Alfreda Regina Knauer. She wrote a book called The Camel's Load in Life and Death. Rung Laoshe knows that book. <laughs> uh, and I think uh, Wang Gongwei Jiaoshu also knows that book. She doesn't know a word of Chinese. Uh, whenever she had a question about Chinese text, and she did often, she would come and ask me. She knew what questions to ask. And she asked intelligent questions, and I answered them. So, look, you can do sinology without knowing Chinese, believe it or not. Uh, whereas, I mean, now you can, apparently. But when I began sinology, and still in my own mind, the kind of sinologist I want to be is someone who is a, a master of old Chinese, who can read it uh, very well, very rigorously, uh, and can solve all sorts of problems problems relating to old Chinese texts. Oketa okay, Kanauer cannot do that, nor can a lot of the people who have been winning the Stanislas Julian Prize. So you can see that sinology has been transformed, has changed. Because what is it now? It's sort of like, um, by whatever means, to be able to illuminate some aspects of old Chinese civilization or culture. And that doesn't necessarily uh, imply mastery of the Chinese language, which it did originally and which it did for me. Because for me, sinology was philology applied to China, and philology is definitely language-centered. The old model of a sinologist for me was exemplified by people like Edward Chaban, Paul Pelio, Bertolt Laufer, Erwin von Sack, uh, people like that. And uh, I consider somebody like uh, Pelio to be almost a god. I mean, I, I really do sort of worship him. I do worship him, I'm sorry. Uh, Pelio was uh, unbelievable. All the languages he knew and his gigantic mind and wisdom and uh, he could just cite things 
from all sorts of fields, you know, Mongolian, Manchu, Persian, Tibetan, uh, Anamite, whatever, he knew it. And that's why when he went to the Dunhuang Caves and he read like a manuscript a minute, he picked the right ones. And Stein, when he went there, could not pick uh, the manuscript so intelligently. So there's a very famous picture of Halio in the cave like this. You, you all know it, right? Huddled over uh, a candle in the cave 17. Uh, and reading the Dunhuang manuscripts, and he could read them all. He could read Chinese extremely well, and he could read all the other languages too. So I dedicated, I dedicated uh, my second book to Paul Palio. My first book was dedicated to my father, and my second was dedicated to Paul Palio, and I still think of him as a, a giant. And I'll, see why I, I worship these guys so much. They're the real Sinologists, like we are something else. <laughs> We, we're struggling as best we can, but you see, they didn't have uh, concordances and indices and computers. They didn't even have Morohashi. I mean, just think what we do with Morohashi, and now people have outgrown Morohashi. How many of you read, how many of you consult Morohashi daily? Well, it used to be when I was a graduate student, you were, you were looking at Morohashi like, every 10 seconds, day, day in and day out. Uh, and now we have Han Yu Dat Si Dian, which is really good, but not good enough. We need another edition, a new edition of Han Yu Dat Si Dian, but we didn't have, uh, people like Peleo, they didn't have it. All they had was something like Pei Wen Yun Fu. And if you've uh, played around with Pei Wen Yun Fu, you know it's, it's hard to get information out of it. It's hard to get a definition out of it because it's, there's no definitions. All it is is a bunch of collection of uh, sentences w w for rhyming purposes. It's a rhyme dictionary. Of course, it's that big. Uh, but that's what they, re those guys really relied upon Pei Wen Yun Fu to figure out old text. Think of it. How much easier our life is now? Well, I grew up you know, I'm an earlier generation than most everybody in this room, in terms of Han Xue. Uh, my teachers really didn't learn Putonghua or Guoyu even. My teachers. Like somebody like Cleves, he was a real Sinologist. He, could, he probably spoke Mandarin better than most of the professors at Harvard. But most of the professors at Harvard in the previous generation didn't speak, or, or in other universities too, they didn't speak Chinese, Mandarin. It, you know, like classical Chinese was a dead language and you don't need to speak it. Um, so it was, it, was a, it was sort of like Greek learning and Latin learning and Sanskrit learning, uh, old Sinology, Indology, Assyriology, you know, Nobody's speaking Assyrian, right? Or Sumerology. <laughs> Those are dead, dead, dead languages. And that's the way people looked upon classical Chinese as a dead, dead language. And there's no reason to learn Putonghua or Guoyu. Now that's all changed. Because I came right at the cusp of the change from those who spoke no Mandarin, or almost no Mandarin, and those who speak good Mandarin. Like all the people now, when they come to our universities, we expect them to have at least six years of Chinese, really good, when they come to study in graduate school. But when I went to graduate school, you could get in a Chinese program without, without knowing any Chinese practically, or just one year. Uh, so I was right on the, the, the border between when it was important to know Mandarin or when it was not important to know. So there's that, been that huge change. Um, of course, that's going to influence the way people look upon old Chinese things because they're now viewing them more and more through the lens of modern Chinese. And I, I, I have to say, there's often a problem in technical terminology in many fields, but let's just take um, 
art history. Because I'm, uh, at Penn, we have a very active art history program, Chinese art history, and I get stuck. I'm on practically every dissertation in Chinese art history, and we have a lot of them. So I'm reading this stuff all the time, art, Chinese art history, and one problem that keeps coming up over and over again is that even these doctoral students, and it's not just at Penn, it's everywhere, they can't distinguish between modern technical vocabulary applied to ancient times and ancient technical vocabulary. It's a big muddle. And I often have to say, when, I, when I'm writing comments on their dissertations, I say, look, you're referring to this uh, term as though it's, uh, it's reified. It's something that refers to something real in the Song or Tang or Nanbei Chao or something. And such a term didn't even exist. This is a modern term. Uh, so this has become a problem because in the old days, people didn't worry about Mandarin. They didn't get mixed up with modern terminology. You see, you see what I'm talking about. In the old days, it was just the old text, and that's all, in English. Uh, so, the, so those old scholars, they had, I'm trying to see, where's my watch? Uh, they, they didn't have uh, Morohashi, they didn't have Hanyu Dat Sidian, they didn't even have Tsuhai for God's sake, or Tsuyan, think about that. Tsuyan and Tsuhai only go back to about the 20, 20s or 30s. They're new. I mean, the whole idea of a dictionary in Chinese is new. A word dictionary. I mean, of course, there were always Zidian from Shouwen Jie Zi, there were Zidian. But it really wasn't until Cihai and Cian that you have Cian. That's why they called them Ci. But you know, there wasn't even a concept for word then. There was no concept for word in Chinese. They, they, so they had to invent a word for word. <laughs> so that's, that's a new term. Uh, and so the, the whole idea of a tzidian just didn't exist because there were no tzi until the, there were no concept of a tzi in Chinese until this word for word was invented. And I can tell you from having taught at places like Hong Kong University, where there are a lot of bright students there. I taught 72 students, like Confucius, 70, uh, and they were the best, the cream of the crop of Hong Kong. And I spent a whole semester trying to tell them what a word is. It just didn't sink in. They couldn't. They really couldn't get it. They thought Chinese only has zi, no, tsi. <laughs> so, I mean, this is understandable because the whole idea of a word in Chinese is new. It's new. And that's why ci yuan and ci hai, you think, how do you write the word ci, the idea of ci in ci yuan and ci hai? Phrase. They wrote phrase. There was, so actually, ci yuan and ci hai are like the very beginnings of word dictionaries in China. And they're more like in the minds of the people who made them, they're more like phrase dictionaries, if you know what I mean. Of course, China, Chinese had words all the way back before the Han. Definitely had words. But it, they weren't a unit of linguistic analysis. It wasn't part of uh, Xiao Xue. You know, Xiao Xue was just so dedicated, minor learning, as opposed to Da Xue. Xiao uh, Xue was dedicated to phonological and orthographical concerns. You know, and that's all this zi oriented, zi. So uh, people like Pelio, these giants, these gods, uh, they didn't have zi dian, but yet they had to analyze text according to the, I mean, as though there were zi 
And they had to have the minds that would extract si from text when there were no sidian around to help them. So uh, we can be grateful for the developments in the 20th century of si hai, si yuan, and then Morohashi. And you have to remember, how great was Morohashi? He has to be almost like a god too for making the dictionary for us, Daikan Wa Jiten. Because, you know, that dictionary was completed and then it was perished in the Tokyo fire bombings. He had to make that dictionary twice. And it's so gigantic. Of course, he had a team of people helping him. But, I mean, we're, my generation was just so indebted to Morohashi and that kind of dictionary because it made our life so much easier than the people who had Sihai and Siyuan, or the people who had only Pei Wen Yunfu. Morohashi was like a great gift to Sinologists. And that's why, I mean, that's one reason why every Sinologist in America, and every, uh, and I think in Europe too, you have to know Japanese, or you don't count. If you don't know Japanese, we're not going to give you a Hakuse. <laughs> we're not going to give you a Boshu Shrewe. You must know Japanese. Because uh, it's not just Morohashi, it's the whole tradition of Japanese kangaku. Like today, in class, uh, I just had another class before this one, and that's why I was a little bit late coming over here. I talked about two topics. Some of my students are here. Um, I talked about gui, which I'll talk about more in a moment. And I talked about liu fa. Liu fa is the uh, six laws. The first... Um, the first, the foundation of Chinese art theory and Chinese art criticism, I guess most, Xie He de Liu Fa, I guess most of you have heard of it. So that's the very, very beginning of Chinese art criticism and art theory. And I showed, uh, I wrote a long paper about this, which I worked on for about 30 years, and I showed that people just haven't understood that text, neither Chinese, nor Americans, nor Europeans, nobody understood that text, including James Cahill, uh, who understood almost everything about Chinese art, uh, until a man named William Acker came along. I think he was a Dutchman, uh, or maybe he was an American who lived in Holland. Anyway, uh, see, you probably have heard of Li Dai Ming Hua Ji, Right? Li Dai Ming Hua Ji. Well, the, the, that was the most important collection of literary, uh, art historical texts in Chinese tradition up through the Tang, and then it had huge influence beyond. And so in the Li Dai Ming Hua Ji, Ji there, uh, the Liu Fa is incorporated. So William Acker, who was, um, he liked to tipple, he, he liked to drink, but he also got inspiration from his drink, I think. He, you know, there's so many wild, weird, bad translations of the Liu Fa, crazy translations. So nobody was understanding it. So Zhang Yanyuan, who was this important editor of Chinese uh, art historical texts, um, incorporated the Liu Fa, and he rewrote them radically. This is very strange. The seminal text of Chinese art criticism was rewritten by the seminal editor of Chinese art history text, Zhang Yanyuan, because he couldn't understand it. It was an admission that the text either was garbled or that it had some kind of secret knowledge or that people just didn't know it, uh, couldn't understand how to read it. They couldn't understand, they couldn't parse it. So, Along comes, I mean, really, for since like 1,500 years, nobody could understand that text. And yet it was the key text of the whole Chinese art historical tradition. So then along comes this guy, William Acker, and he reads it, and it makes sense. And he read it in the old way. The first time it really made sense to anyone. And so I got really excited because I'd been troubled by the fact that for... As long as I knew that text, I'd never encountered an intelligent or an intelligible translation of it. 
So then I started to figure out how and why Acker got it right. And guess what? It's because he followed the old Japanese way of reading it. It said something like, sense of it is because he followed the old Japanese, a very old Japanese way of reading the text, which was um, Japanese, you know, the Japanese have a way of reading Chinese text that is very rigorous and almost mechanical in terms of transforming what is kind of like unclear Chinese grammar into very precise and clear Japanese grammar. And so he would say, uh, uh, Acker followed these old Chinese, the Japanese grammarians, these old J Japanese scholars, and they said, uh, Ichi ko, uh, kori nari. You know, they would say, for the yeah, they would say nari. And it, and it all fell together and made sense. He read it just like a Japanese. And then I went beyond that a little bit, and I figured out all the Sanskrit background that had escaped everyone else. Because if you don't know that the Liu Fa is related to Liu Zhi Shadanga from India, you can't possibly figure it out because there are some very recondite types of knowledge in that text that are Indian influence, but they're very, very subtle. And it takes a lot of effort to extract them. So that's where I went beyond Acker. So, uh, I'm being grateful to Morohashi and to the Japanese Sinologists who are like our mentors. Like, we Western Sinologists, in, you know, there was a time when uh, Japan, I mean, China was closed off to the world from 1949 until Deng Xiaoping opened up China. It was pretty much closed. And foreigners, scholars, couldn't come here to study. But yet they wanted to study. So where'd they go? They went to Japan. So there's the old generation, the, re the old, old generation who just learned classical Chinese and didn't pay any attention to Japanese or any modern language or uh, certainly not to Mandarin. Then there comes another generation that sneaks in there just before me. And that's like uh, the people who were going to Japan when China was still closed up. And they all learned Japanese. One of the guys I'm going to talk about soon is Hartwell. His generation was, they were all learning Ch Japanese. And all the people who were the great scholars of Chan, Zen, they were all going to Japan to learn. And they, they were good in Japanese, but not good in Putonghua or Guoyu. And so they, I'm saying we have a debt to, in that generation of, especially, you know, Japanese scholars who were really devoted to kangaku, not kokugaku, kangaku, and who were really good at it. And there's a, it's just like, you know, there was another generation. Before that generation of Japanese-influenced sinologists, people like, Cleves, or, or actually people like uh, Pelio and Siobhan, guess what language they learned? Manchu. All those old sinologists of the 19th century, late 19th century, they all learned Manchu, just the way Hartwell and those guys learned Japanese, and the way you all are learning, you all learn Mandarin, Putonghua. Everybody had to learn Manchu. 
And if you want to ask me why in the question period, I'll be happy to reply. There is a good reason. Um, so then, um, then there was another great transformation. Around the same time, Sihai and Suyuan were being edited. <clears throat> we start to get the Harvard Yanjing indices, Hafo Yanjing Soy. And this was a fantastic boon to scholars of Chinese. Now, I knew William Hong, Hong Ye, who was the chief editor of those indis, uh, indices. In the indices. And he's the guy who didn't want to be ca called Cha Bo Shi. <laughs> so he, he was um, a phenomenal person. He w had been the former, uh, I think, the former dean at Yanjing Dashue. And he was responsible for keeping Langdon Warner for ste from stealing all of the Dunhuang wall paintings. And a uh, very interesting guy. He, he, he was the editor of the Harvard Yanjing Indices. And he went home and told his father, who was a traditional scholar, he told his dad what he was doing. And his dad got very angry. He says, now look, any old person will be able to read the classics now because they won't have to memorize them. So you're doing something very bad. Uh, of course, William Hong was proud of what he did, but his father couldn't understand because his father was from an earlier generation of traditional Chinese scholars who, they didn't need any uh, indices. They memorized texts. Um, I think people like Wang Guowei, they, were, they had that kind of mind. And of course, somebody like Wang Guowei was also learning German philosophy, and he applied it to the study of Hong Meng, for example. So there was this uh, a transformation within traditional Chinese scholarship, too, that involved cross-fertilization with uh, Western learning. And so you get these supreme scholars in China, like Wang Guowei, who, who um, are good in the old way, but they're also learning European approaches as well. Okay, then after we have the Harvard Yanjing indices, we're also getting the um, uh, French concordances and indices. And practically, and then we get the Chinese university ones. Uh, so we pra have practically everything we need now with an index or a concordance, so you can look things up. But even those now have been tied because everybody's looking things up electronically, and we have databases. Uh, every Chinese, old Chinese text practically is on a database. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Goyi now. Um, this is another paper I wrote recently. <laughs> But a paper I worked on for 30 years, like the Leopold paper. I like to work on papers for 30 years, because then they mature. And also, if you wait long enough to write your paper, new technologies will become available, which will help you. And if I had written my Liu uh, Goyi paper, if I had finished my Goyi paper five years after I started it, like back in 1972, 73, I wouldn't have been able to achieve what I did when I finished it in uh, like 2004 or something because of all the new technologies. And I'll explain. Hey. I don't know if... Uh, does everybody in the room know this term? Who does, don't be shy or bashful or ashamed. Who does not know this term? Thank you, Steve, for being honest. Right. Both hands up. Third of one. Everybody else knows this term, right? Everybody. Third of one. Who doesn't know it? Everybody, are you all being honest? Come on. Be like Steve. Do you know it or not? No. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I'm going to do this again. I'm going to do it two ways. Who knows what this term means? Hold up your hand real high. 
like this. <laughs> uh, one more, please. <laughs> okay. Who does not know what this term means? No, not like this. This. Oh, very different set of answers coming up now. I had to coax it out of you. Come on, if you're in my class, you get no candy. <laughs> you have to be honest and forthright if you want to take a class with Victor Mayer. Otherwise, you'll get in trouble. Uh, so, th th this term is very prominent in Buddha Dawa studies, Buddhism and Taoism. And I'm going to be very fast. Like today in my class, I talked about it for about 40 minutes, and I could talk about it for two or three hours. But I'm going to try to talk about it in six or seven minutes. Blah, 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 real fast. So, Gai uh, is supposed to mean, uh, it's supposed to mean, a, a, a modern scholarship says that it means matching concepts or matching terms. And the whole idea is that this is how Taoism, a Buddhism came to China, sort of like on the coattails of Taoism, that you took a Buddhist term in Sanskrit and you wanted to translate it into Chinese, you matched it up with a Taoist term, like, say, Wu with Nirvana. Okay, that's the theory. And it was... Everybody believed this in the 20th, from the 50s on, in the 20th century. It's in every Chankao Shu, every Bai Ke Quan Shu. It's the standard definition that it, it is a type of translation that enabled Buddhism to come to China by emulating, uh, matching terms in Taoism. I, I first heard about this from my teachers, I heard about it from Leon Hurwitz uh, and Robert uh, and Edwin Kanzi, especially Hurwitz. Who, these are great scholars of Buddhism. And from the very first time I heard of it, I didn't believe what they were saying. I was skeptical. And then Nagatomi at Harvard tells me all over. And it's in every book about Buddhism. And I just couldn't believe it because... In my estimation, when Buddhism came to China, it was a very well-established religion, and Taoism wasn't even a religion. What would there be for Buddhism to emulate or mohafang about Taoism? It wasn't a religion. And then everything I could see about Taoism as a religion, as an organized religion, looked like Buddhism. For example, Sanzang. Sandong, you know, the Taoist, trip, uh, Taoist canon has the three portions. And then you read all of these Taoist texts from the six dynasties when Taoism is becoming a religion, and they look very, very Buddhist. Like sometimes 40, 50, 60 percent of the vocabulary is Buddhist, flat out Buddhist. So I was saying to myself, hmm, this can't be. Uh, something's wrong with the definition Goyi. <laughs> So I started to look at it, and that's like 30 years ago, when I first heard it from Nagatomi in 1970, the second heard it in 1972, I really got troubled. And I started to read everything I could about it, and um, I kept researching it, and putting things in big folders, and then finally by about, uh, maybe about the year 2000, two or th three, I said, now I can, I'm going to start to write this paper. It's been sitting around too long. So I started to write it. And then along come a group of new graduate students, people like uh, uh, Josh Capitanio, Dan Boucher. I mean, these are my graduate students in Buddhism. And Yang Jidong. And um, they just, they were all very good with computers. And I'm very bad with computers. But I know what computers can do. So I asked my graduate students, I said, please do some searches for me. Search every text in Chinese from the Han Dynasty to the modern period and find Ge Yi. And it turned out that Ge Yi was a phantom. It really didn't exist, except for about a 50-year period in 
in the third century. And I, I can't go into all the details like I did in my class this afternoon, but I will, I'll try to be as concise as possible. That uh, there is a Chinese monk named Zhu um, Zhu Faya who wanted to cope with numbered lists in Sanskrit texts. That's what it was. I can't tell you how I figured this out, but the tax, the, the, there's a little biography of Zhu Faya in the Gao Song Zhuan. It's just very short. And it said he invented this method of Gu Yi. He's the guy responsible. And it says exactly what Gu Yi uh, was meant to do. But the problem is it's hard to read. It's hard to understand. The text is opaque. And if you just read it, Mama Hu Hu Da Chu Du Xia Chu. You're going to misunderstand what, uh, what Gao Song Zhuan is saying. And that's how everybody was misreading the text, his biography. It says it's for um, coping with numbered lists in Sanskrit texts. Now, Chinese did not like numbered lists. The Indians love numbered lists. Like, the Buddha has so many physical appearances. And there, in this philosophy, there are 38 uh, categories. Okay? That's what Indian philosophy and Indian iconography is all about, these numbered lists. But if you look in old Chinese philosophy, you very seldom will find any list, and certainly not lists over five. But the Indians are nuts about lists. They just go crazy with giving you lists of all sorts of things, They're up into the hundreds. So when the Chinese first encounter, encountered Buddhism, they were like, we don't know what to do with all these lists. So Zhu Faya tried to invent a method. He failed. It didn't work. And then a very famous Chinese monk named Dao An said, forget it. Scratch. <laughs> so it only lasted like 40, 40, 50 years. And it had no impact. It was repudiated by the, the most eminent scholar, Buddhist scholar, Dao An, and nobody talked about it again. But yet, people were saying in modern China and in Japan, people like uh, Tsukamoto Zenryu, they were saying, well, even in the Song Dynasty, or Xuan Xue in the Nanbei Chao, Xuan Xue, if it weren't for Ge Yi, these things wouldn't exist. But that is Hu Shuo Ba Dao. It's not true. It is fake. It's false learning to say this kind of thing. Um, there's no such thing as Gai Buddhism. They, in Japanese, they say Kakugi Bukkyo, or in Chinese, Gai Fojiao. Fo no. That's only a figment of modern scholars' imagination. So then I, in the, just before I was about to publish this paper, I was in Kyoto. And I went to the Jinbun, Kagaku Kenkyu Jo, and I used their magnificent library, and I found an article that I had not come across in 30 years. It was by Chayinka, and it was he who started this notion. I think it was late 20s, 29 or 30. My hero, Chayinka, had committed the basic misinterpretation of, of uh, Ge Yi. And then a, a Beida professor named Tang Yong Tung, I think you all know, a great uh, professor of Buddhism at Beida, he followed Chan Yin Ke's explanation. And um, then the whole world learned from Tang Yong Tung. <laughs> and everybody, including Nagatomi, and uh, every professor, every scholar was saying that this is what Ge Yi means, and it doesn't. But, okay, so how could I write this paper? This is what I'm saying about how we do Han Xue now. I could not have written that paper in the definitive way I did. I wrote it's definitive, and already nobody's, people have stopped talking about Ge Yi. It's a non-entity. Uh, because of the paper I wrote. I could not have written that paper without electronic databases. Impossible. 
because I could read the whole Suku Chen Shu in an hour. Ha ha ha, you want to try it? And I could read the whole Buddhist canon in 60 seconds. You want to try it? And I can say there were no instances of gai in all of these texts. And yet people like Chen Yinke and everybody was saying that gai was so important. It's, it's fake. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. We can now do these phenomenal things in scholarship because of our technologies. And we're so lucky. I mean, I'm very lucky to have lived to the, this time because now we have copying machines and we have email. And I didn't have a copying machine. I had to type my dissertation real hard through five carbon copies. And if I made a mistake, I couldn't change it. You think how easy it is for you to change your mistakes. Okay, in the future, there will be more things like databases. There will be more sophisticated ways to get at learning. And the scholars in the future will be able to make greater advances than we made. We'll be able to do fantastic things. It, it, I just hope I can keep living to see as many of them as, I, as possible, because I know they're going to be unbelievable. So now I will, uh, I'll close in about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, still have some things to say. I want to pay tribute to a former colleague named Robert Hartwell. <laughs> uh, Valerie was his student. <laughs> He was a very strange man. <laughs> he was hyper conservative. And he wore bolo ties. And he was like a cowboy. And if you asked to take a portrait of him, he'd put on a pistol and a rifle and glare at you underneath the cowboy hat. But he was a great scholar and a great teacher. Um, the reason I'm talking about Robert Hartwell is because Robert Hartwell had a, 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 what you could say, an inglorious end. A lot of bad things happened to him toward the end of his life. Really bad stuff. And he died too early. Uh, but he was a stubborn man and a great scholar. He was a Sung economic historian. And he trained about six of America's greatest Sung historians. So this is just to show you uh, the impact of one man through his determination and his, you know, you could even say stubbornness and his ingenuity, his creativity, how one man can influence uh, generations. Because like through Valerie and um, Robert Hines and Paul Smith and Hugh Clark and all these great scholars that were trained by him, they're training students. Uh, you just think of all the people that Valerie's been training. And she's the disciple of Hartwell, and her disciples are his grandchildren. Uh, so <clears throat> Hartwell was trained at the University of Chicago, and he got the idea he was going to put into a computer all the biographical information about people in the Song Dynasty. That, exists. Now you have to remember when Hartwell did this, we just had tiny little computers. Like your little laptop were probably 10 times, 20 times, 100 times more powerful than Hartwell's computer. I mean, he was working at the beginning of computers and he, he was so stubborn. He said, I'm going to put, I mean, he started out with cards or something, computer cards, which was really old. And then you got into floppy disks. Can you imagine trying to put all the sum biographical information that exists on floppy disks? You don't even know what they are. You have thumb drives that can hold like a thousand floppy disks. So <clears throat> Hartwell said, I got to do this. So he, I don't know if he invented it or he got it. He got something called a Bernoulli box. It's very mysterious. 
a Bernoulli box. And he was very proud of his Bernoulli box. <clears throat> and he plugged it into his computer, and night and day, and he had a, his wife was named Marianne, Marianne Carlson, and they worked on this together. And they did nothing except input some biographical data. Uh, forever and ever. So it's all in there. And it's fantastic. I mean, you could write hundreds of PhD dissertations on the basis of what's in Hartwell's databases. And, you know, I like, there's for one, one thing that always sticks in my mind, I, I wanted to look up literacy uh, in the Song Dynasty. And I, I said, Bob, I said, can you help me look in your, your database for information about literacy? And he goes, Brr. and out comes this something so precious. I, I want somebody to write a paper, a, a, a dissertation about it. An illiterate Buddhist monk that's in his database. I mean, an illiterate Buddhist monk in what that guy did. And so there's all this great material in there. And, okay, so then Hartwell got in all kinds of trouble near the end of his life. Big trouble. He was on national TV, that kind of big trouble. Um, and he couldn't get along with his colleagues in the history department. He ended up in my department like a refugee. He got kicked out or he ran away from the history department. He even tried to run away from the whole of the University of Pennsylvania. So he ended up hating Pennsylvania. And so when he, he, he got real sick, he retired and went off to live in a log cabin in, where was it, Wyoming, I think, out in the mountains. Huh? Montana. Okay, one of those states out there, Montana. So, and then... He was on the downhill. He had some bad health problems, and so he was, going, he was dying. And, he, and everybody was so worried about this precious database. What's going to happen to it? And he says, one thing's sure, I'm not giving it to Penn. <laughs> so he starts looking around where to put the database. And, you know, there's a very energetic professor at Harvard named Peter Bull. And it ended up at Harvard. So what's fantastic, and why I'm going on about this, because I admire Hartwell so much, um, is because what's being done with that database now, and it's an example of what I think of as the future of Sinology. And that is, Peter Bull and his group, and various groups in China, have wedded uh, Hartwell's data to GIS, Geographic Information Systems. So, you know, you go in and you push a button and you see on the map where people were located. And then you have networks, like where were groups of people located? And like people who got married, where were they? Different parts of China. It's a visualization of uh, information that was only verbal before in a written text. It becomes visual in a map. And so you can see the kind of fantastic things that are happening because of some stubborn old guy uh, 30 or 40 years ago who said, I'm going to do something that only I can imagine, and I don't care what everybody else says. Everybody thought he was crazy, but he did it. And people are, we're all benefiting. So now I'm going to have a, an academic lottery, an academic raffle. I have two copies of this book. I thought the author would be here today. I don't see him. Um, this book is just came out. It's still hot off the press. It's still warm. I was going to give it to Endymion Wilkinson. Uh, and I'll tell you why I was going to give it to him, but then I changed my mind. <laughs> because Endymion Wilkinson is sitting back there, and I have to uh, call attention to him, too, because as much as I admire Hartwell, I also admire Endymion Wilkinson. I'm not going to say all of his glorious titles uh, because that, that would probably embarrass him. But he's the man who wrote the manual for the study of Chinese history, the one from Harvard. I don't know. Everybody in this room should have it. It's been through two editions. I think it started out yellow and went blue, or was it bluer than yellow? Anyway, the next one, it's almost out, is going to be red. And it's for a reason, because 
it goes up to communist China. But if you want to know how to do Han Xue, if you want to be an accomplished Han Xue Jia, buy his book and master it. Just learn everything in his book. It's like this thick, all done by him, one man. It's mind-boggling. It has to do with money, metrics, calendrics, languages, uh, text, weights and measures, uh, music, medicine, science, anything you can think of about Chinese history, it's in his book. And it's like a guide to how to do research. And it should be your Bible. I'm serious. That's the Bible for a Sinologist. Um, and I hope he, I mean, he spent 12 years on this third edition and it's about to come out, I think 12 years. It's about to come out and um, it'll be great to have it. And I hope he writes another one 12 years from now. <laughs> but I hope he also has a more, an easier life for the next 12 years because to write a book like that by yourself must be just so hard. But it's like that stubbornness of people like Hartwell who just, I'm going to do it. And there's Endymion Wilkinson said, right there he is, sitting in the back of the room. You should all go meet him. <laughs> he said, I'm going to do it. And he did it, three editions. Uh, so that's like where, where Sinology is now, you go read his book. Uh, and I was going to give this book to him in gratitude uh, this book is called, uh, it's by a guy named Yi Hua. It's Yi Hua Xian Hu Shuo. Yi Yi Xia Xian Hu Shuo. So like, uh, the barbarian, Eastern barbarians in the Xia, uh, a theory on their precedence, so like which came first and which came that day in their relationship. And the author's name is Yi Hua. He is a uh, researcher at um, I, I can only say it in Chinese. I wouldn't be able to say it in English. So, Ipa, very good scholar, a young scholar. And the reason I'm, uh, I'm going to have a raffle for this book. I was going to give it to Endymion, but then I thought, uh, maybe somebody else wants it. But so, if you want this book, oh, what I have to tell you what this book is about. It's, uh, it's about the evolution of Chinese civilization in the Bronze Age. And why I'm saying this, uh, presenting this to you in a lecture on Sinology is because this is like the new wave of Sinology in China. This is what I think the best kind of Sinology is emerging within China because I think Sinology have you all hearing me? Okay. I think Sinology in the future must be all of this kind. That you can't just be a philosopher. You also have to be a scientist. Um, so you need to be an anthropologist. This book, you know, it's anthropology, it's metallurgy, it's uh, agricultural studies, it's archaeology. It uses all this kind of material to come up, up with a convincing answer of the relationship between Yi and Xia, and uh, how China emerged from that interaction between the two. It's a, I think it's a work of genius. It's a really wonderful book. And he's still not well known in China, but he will be. Um, so the title in English, you can get an example, it says, A Perspective on Yi and Xia. China in the Bronze Age world system. Oh, do I love that. Because world system, that's another thing I want to say about Sinology now and in the future, is that you can't just do China as Zhongguo, the central kingdom. You can no longer just think of China as isolated behind the Great Wall. China has been interconnected with the world since the very beginning. I mean, like, I, don't, I won't say anything in detail right now, because if you get me started on this, you'll be here until like 9.30 tonight. Uh, 
But this, here's, a, here's a young Chinese scholar who's using traditional Chinese learning, Western learning, combining them, multidisciplinary. So we're going to have a raffle. Uh, anybody who wants this book, and it's a great book, uh, Zhang Xing will hand around a ticket. And you put it, you remember your number, and she, so she'll pull up, you do it. Huh? Keep. Yeah, so you what you do, you you write your name, one one, put it in the box, and keep the receipt. You can also Yeah, or you yeah, you don't even have to write your name because you just rely on it. Okay, so all you do is just like if you want the book, right? I only want people to take this if they really want the book. I don't really just put this in the choti somewhere. Huh? Yeah, okay, you pull it off and put it in the box. And don't take one unless you really want to read it. You hear me? Okay. So this, is, I think, is a great new wave of Chinese, uh, new kind of Chinese synology. Just random. So if you can, well, I want to present it. Okay, when you, Tear off one, don't tear off more than one. No cheating, only one. I mean, I, I get cheated first when you wouldn't admit about <laughs> Gui. Uh, so, uh, almost done. Um, so the other, I said just now that I think uh, the future of Sinology has to be multidisciplinary. Uh, and then beyond that, I would like to encourage you to write things collaboratively to, because nobody now is able to command all these various fields except Endymion. You, know, you have to be able to spread across so many fields it's virtually impossible to, and even within one field you can barely keep up with the literature. So uh, don't be embarrassed or bashful. You know, we humanists, humanists are always just like stuck in their cubby holes, in their, their, their studies, their offices, and they just work by themselves, and they don't work very much with other people. But I would encourage you to write things collaboratively. collaboratively. And I, I think the last three or four of my books have all been written jointly with other people. And... One of my, I mean, I've written a couple of genetics papers, and there can be like 20 authors on a genetics paper, and everybody works together and contributes something. So this happens very much in the sciences, and I hope that in Sinology, which should grow toward being a rigorous science, that uh, you won't be a, afraid to collaborate with others and write papers uh, together with people. So I, that's all I want to say, and I'm happy to entertain questions. I hope I don't leave you speechless. Valerie. So up until the raffle, I was thinking, I was, I, I was wondering about, and the definition you started with of, of synology is something for foreigners to do. And, and uh, what's the relationship, the simple question is, what's the relationship of translation and synology? Uh, oh. And another way of putting that is, do Chinese people really do synology? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Uh, I, being both a sinologist and a translator, I say that they are different things. Because to be a good translator, and there's a guy named Brendan O'Kane sitting right behind you, who's a very good translator. Uh, a young man from Temple, but hanging around Beijing too long. Anyway, he's a great translator. And you don't have to be a sinologist to be a translator. It helps. But you know, the most important thing about being a, a good translator is to know English well. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I mean, in most Americans, English is their native tongue. They don't know English well enough. So they can't write good translations. I'm not kidding you. 
That's why my brother Dennis is also a great translator, because his English is so darn good. It's not because his Chinese is darn good. It is. But more importantly, it's because your, your own mother tongue is good. So if you want to be a good translator from English into Chinese, your Chinese better be darn good. And I have to say, the reason my English is good is because I was an English major. My is English, not and I'm very glad about that because now when I translate, I can write felicitously and make things sound nice. And a lot of times, you know, like Ezra Pound, I mentioned him earlier. Uh, what was the earlier context? Uh, oh, Achilles. Achilles Pound. Yeah. So Ezra Pound, he learned his, he, he approached Chinese through Fenelosa, you know, the guy from Boston Museum. And Fenelosa learned his Chinese in Japan. And that's why it's not Li Bo or Li Bai, it's Li Haku. Okay? And Hakuku, Hakuku Yi, not Bo Ju Yi or Ban Ju Yi. So that's how uh, Ezra Pound learned his Chinese through Achilles. And Achilles was in close connection with Fenelosa. And Ezra also knew Fenelosa uh, and knew his work. Okay, so you read any translation by Ezra Pound of a Chinese poem. It's beautiful. It's fantastic. And often he catches the exact essence of a Chinese poem. But guess what? He wasn't a good sinologist. No. He was not a sinologist, but he's a fantastic translator. So that answers your first question. Right? Okay. Okay? Now your second question, which is... Repeat it. Do Chinese people do sinology? Oh yeah, do Chinese people do sinology? Well, according to the Han Yu Dat Sidian, they cannot do sinology. <laughs> because sinology is for Wai Guoren. And Han Yu Dat Sidian is very authoritative. Uh-huh. So, all of these bases here, they must be for Wai Guoren. Ah, uh, well, this is very interesting because maybe Maybe Han Shui now is becoming something that Chinese can do. Maybe there now are, like Ihua, people who can do sinology. But it's not the same as Chuan Chong Zhong Wo, Wen Shi Shui. And then he, he, he will know something about this. Well, uh, I, I simply wanted to ask a question. Oh, wait a minute. You have to speak very loudly because I have. I wanted to ask a question. Oh, another question. Yes. Okay. okay. I may have to following on again. from Valerie's question. Which what? Is following <laughs> from Valerie's question. Oh, okay. I have so that here, so I can come there. I can. I can hear. Following, following from following from Valerie's question, which is a very perceptive one. Can you think of anybody in my country, in England, who would do Englandology? <laughs> Englandology. It, it doesn't make much sense. Can you think of anybody in America doing Americanology? I guess they would study the Indian tribes, the, the ethnic people. So, Sinology, Sinology, it seemed to me you described very well, was at a time, it started at a time when there were no dictionaries, there were no, there was, there were no tools of the trade, so they had to do philology. But now, as you've also described so well, we have databases and so on. Sinology is dead. <laughs> it's finished. Oh. We have historians of China, and we have historians of China in China. We have historians of China in foreign countries. There's no distinction. We're all gathered together with the same purpose. Uh, you can have an Egyptologist, because ancient Egypt is dead. But. China is still alive and very much connected with its past. And therefore, why separate the two things, modern China from ancient China, and have Sinology for ancient China, and whatever you have, China watches for modern China. So, Sinology, in my view, Victor, with due respect, is dead. Thank you. Oh, boy. He, did you hear the radical stuff he was saying? Han Xue Xi Xin Dai Bu Xin Dai. But what am I then? <laughs> anyway, 
described as a very eloquent statement and provocative. Uh, Sinology is dead. Uh, but then it's not so dead because, uh, well, wait a minute. This is very interesting. I didn't talk about this. It says Han Xue Jia in Chinese, but here it says China Studies, which is, okay, it's still alive for the foreigners. It's, wait a minute, this is for the foreigners. China Studies. It fits with what you said. But this is like Bao Gu Dong, Zai Han Xue Jia, Yi Jing Si Diao. But it's in the Chinese. Now, wait a minute, do we have Sinology anywhere here? Not one of them used the word Sinology, right, in English? Wait a minute. No, Chinese classics. So nobody, you know, the Chinese, when they wrote this English, they were very careful to avoid the word Sinology. So you can see it's, it's in a state of flux. Whether or not Sinology is alive or dead or dying, one thing we know for sure, it's transforming. It's not the same as it was for Paleo or Stanislas Julien. It's not the same as it was for Hartwell. Uh, it's different. And, but see, that's why I, I think probably Endymion wouldn't call himself a sinologist, or he wouldn't call his book a sinological handbook. It's a book for the study of Chinese history. Yeah. And in that sense, uh, sinology may be like mm, no longer relevant, except I'm a guy who is straddling philology in the new Chinese studies and is trying to be relevant before I die. I'm, not, I'm still alive. <laughs> so in a sense, in me, Han Xue is still alive because I'm stubborn and I want to keep staying a sinologist. I'm stubborn. Okay, hi, Yosha, my man. One, one more way. One last year. My old friend. Hey, I, I want to say something to appreciate him. There are two people in this room, Wang Ma Wei and Rong Xinjiang. They are both very, uh, I'll let you speak in a moment. I'm going to speak first. Okay. They are both very eminent professors here at Beida. Tremendous accomplishments, both of them. He's in Indian studies and he's in medieval, like Tom studies, room. Okay, so both of these guys, who has that book? Hold up the Wei Hai. Yeah, Yu Biao Yan. Hold it up. No, the other one. There. So they. They were involved in the translation of that book into Chinese. How long? 20, 25 years ago? 20 yeah, years ago? Yeah, 20, more than 20 years ago. And they did a beautiful in translation. And, and uh, at the request of the famous Ji Xian Lin, his name is on the front of that book. So anyway, I want to thank them for when they were very young uh, for translating that book. Okay, now thank, you, you say your piece. Thank you for your good word. Uh, the, I, you see, another question about I discussed uh, the meaning of the Gaye, Gaye you mentioned you're talking a lot about. Uh, uh, simply or literally, if we understand it, is uh, some Gaye means uh, try to understand or try to do research on the meaning of the words, as uh, you mentioned uh, from Zhu Faya. And, uh, and uh, I agree with you, uh, the meaning of these words or the influence of these words uh, uh, was uh, exaggerated by, by a Japanese scholar and then followed by some other scholars. But um, it's basically it's quite simple. Just for example, as a way of uh, phenology study, you see, you try to understand the world, and the KE is just uh, uh, during that time, the people want to. To, uh, to explore some way to deal with the translation. And uh, for example, the, uh, you start your speech today with the uh, uh, introduce uh, of those titles of the four or five, five titles of the Chinese uh, 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 GD or some Yuan. Uh, uh, to me, it looks something, you are doing some Yi. 
<laughs> what is this? The chance was uh, how to translate or the meaning if, if it is exactly compatible to the chance translation. Uh, and uh, you say the Han Xue Jiang, you cannot find the you cannot find the Han Xue Jiang's word in the uh, what is that? The first, some 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 title at first I I know I know the Chinese title I never some of them I never saw it the Chinese English title of the Peking University International Academy for Chinese Studies. These are official English titles. Oh, and official. the Chinese Learning or the National, you know, National Institute. You know, we we Chinese people we have we like some big words. Last <laughs> Institute uh, means it is the most prominent institute or supported government, or institute supported kind of government, or uh -huh. institute or national institute. Only, for example, the library, we say national library means the library that by its child, that is a national library. But here, <laughs> whenever we are debating why going to that here, there's another national institute out there. Exactly the same name of the Han Xue Highway, Han Xue Yenju So, I just don't know. Han Han Xue Yenju Tung Xin. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the copy is something more called the Highway, Han Xue, or Muji Han Xue. International Security. So that always, we are doing that. We, do, we, are, we are doing something new, new, good. <laughs> you can say that. I, I'm not going to respond. <laughs> uh, all I will say is that uh, at least they didn't use the word oriental. Yeah. And that would have been a big can of worms. No oriental. Oriental is like really, really dead. And I agree with that because I, I lived through a, cha a department changing its name from Department of Oriental Studies and then having a war and having its name changed to Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, and then having another war, I mean really wars, academic wars, and then having, I mean, my department was occupied, occupied by radical students who said, no Oriental Studies. And they didn't know a single word of any Oriental language. <laughs> you know, and we believe, we Zhao Shou, woman, Ex Oriente Lux. From the Orient comes light. We think Orient is something great. And yet these students were trying to tell us Orient is demeaning. And there was Oriental Noodle Factory down in Chinese town. Chinatown. Oriental Noodle Factory. Why are the Chinese calling their own things Oriental? Well, anyway, there's no Oriental left. It's dead because of Edward Said. Anything else? How you went, Zima? No, you, you did your guy. Okay. Uh, Jim, next, but you, you have a question. Please, you speak very loudly, please. I'm a graduate student of College of Language and Literature of Beijing Normal University. So I come here to hear your speech, and I want to ask a detailed uh, question about what, what's your opinion on the necessity of giving a definition? Because when you talk about Pei Ben Yun Fu, you said it's a chip, and it's not very good at giving definitions. It doesn't have any definition. Yeah. yeah. No. So and, what's my opinion about what? Yeah, so, and, and also when we talk about the translation and communication among different people, we always say it's, it's important to give an, an exact definition. But I'm wondering if it, it's, it's helpful to give a definition if the... To understand the Chinese concept, we know Give definition to Ren and also Zhuangzi and Dao in the in the Laozi. They are the Taoist. They are totally against. They're what? Against giving giving definition. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? 
So, um, I, I mean, if it's a, a helpful, and it will it be hurtful or have some negative effects when they learn Chinese traditional culture or when, when we try to understand the, the traditional Chinese culture, is it very important or what's your opinion on the importance of giving a definition? Okay. Since, since you have... Um, I'll answer it this way. Please read between the lines. First of all, I, I translated both the Laozi and the Zhuangzi, and I love the Zhuangzi. And I think I communicated with Zhuangzi when I translated his text, and I conveyed to the American English reader what Zhuangzi is all about, the spirit. Um, and I, I want to say this, that if you get hung up on definitions, you're not going to be a good translator. <clears throat> because you have to understand a whole sentence, a whole text, a whole paragraph. If you're just uh, translating word by word, see, this is one of the worst things about translating Chinese, especially classical Chinese. You just say one word by one word by one word. You're going to have garbage, gibberish. It's terrible. And I, and I will just tell you, I see Brendan nodding his head. <laughs> so I will just tell you, like, uh, I taught at Donghai University for a couple of years, and I had a student, I called him a living dictionary, he memorized the whole English dictionary. He really did. He memorized the entire English dictionary, and he could recite all the definitions in, a Chinese, in an English dictionary, but he couldn't write in a single intelligible English sentence. And he got D's in my class. And he, knew, he memorized every definition, so that's my answer. Okay? Maybe one more question. Or if you have no more questions, no more questions. And if you, you can, a few of you maybe come up to see me individually, or you can even send me an email. If you have some lingering question later on, you can send me an email, and I'll try to answer it, although I'm usually weeks behind in my email. Anyway, it's been a great pleasure to come here, and uh, I enjoy talking to you. Victor, what about the rat? Oh, the rat? Where is it? Oh, I get to pull it. I hope that Endemian gets it. Oh. Number 17. Who is 17? Oh. I will come and make a formal presentation. <laughs> You're welcome. She's from his same institute. And the book is brand new. I got one before she did. <laughs>